So, so let me ask you this morning, when was the last time you had your heart checked? Uh, anybody had a, uh, uh, a heart appointment lately? Nobody wants to admit it. I know Mark has. He had a, he had a stress test lately. Um, by the way, I have a stethoscope if anybody would like to have your heart checked this morning. I am, I do have, I don't make much of it, but I have an honorary doctor's degree. And so I can check your heart at the conclusion of the service if you'd like for me to do that. Um, man, for me, uh, uh, going to the cardiologist is a, is a frequent event. Um, I do yearly stress tests. I do yearly plaque tests. I do yearly echocardiograms. I do very frequent, um, I got them all listed here because there's so many of them. I do many, uh, I do frequent blood tests. I do frequent EKGs. Um, I do frequent checkups. As a matter of fact, there's times that I think my cardiologist knows me better than I know myself. Which is good, because when you've had a few heart issues, like I've had a few heart issues, you want your cardiologist to know the condition of your heart. Well, just as it's important for us to have physical checkups, and I would say this, it is important for us to take care of ourselves. It is important for us to have physical checkups. And if you haven't seen your doctor lately, I would encourage you to do that, all right? There's my plug there. But uh, just as it's important for us to have physical checkups, It is equally important for us to have spiritual examinations. Uh, I was thinking as I was praying through this, you know, they have so many machines and so much technology in this day and age that, you know, they can can scan so many things. I was actually at my cardiologist on Thursday, and they did did a carotid scan, and the doctor said they actually can, can check my carotid from here all the way up into my brain. And so not only here, but they can scan all the way up. I was a little concerned. You know, the, uh, the technician was doing it. You know, when you hear him going, hmm, <laughs> hmm. I, so, so I looked at her and said, have you found anything up there? I thought maybe she had done a scan and there was, uh, you know, it was empty up there. But I was thinking, wouldn't it be great if all of a sudden we could have this imaging device that not only would scan my heart and your heart physically, but we'd have this imaging device that would scan our heart spiritually. And we could get a true, honest indication of what is the spiritual condition of our hearts. So, so here's what I want to ask you today. I want to ask you today to, to view today's message as a doctor's appointment. Now, would you do it now? Now, by that, I don't want you to say, okay, you know what, I'm going to cancel it then and turn around and walk out, all right? Because sometimes we're guilty of doing that with doctor's appointments, all right? I don't want to go to the doctor, I'm going to cancel it, and I'm going to turn around and leave. But I want you to view today's message as a doctor's appointment, allowing the Word of God to do a thorough examination of your heart and mine. You know as well as I do, sometimes we're caught by surprise when we have an examination. Because sometimes we think that we are in one condition when really there is a completely different condition. Maybe an undetected condition. Maybe an undetected sickness in our lives. And so today my challenge to you is to allow the great physician to allow Jesus Christ to do a thorough examination of your heart and mine. One verse today, one very simple verse, but one profound verse. I'll put it up on the screen, Matthew chapter five and verse eight. Jesus says this, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Would you read that? Let's read that together and kind of allow the words to sink into your mind and into your heart. Would you read that with me today? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. One more time. Read it with me one more time. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Lord, today we we open ourselves up to you. We recognize that we are in the presence of the great physician. We realize today that we are in the presence of someone who 
understands our spiritual condition even better than we do. God, it's very easy for us to mask our real condition. It's very easy for us to to feign or to pretend that we are one way when we really are a different way. It's easy for us to pretend that we're well when in reality we're sick. So I pray today that the Holy Spirit of God would use the Word of God. Help us to see ourselves as you see us. And we promise to give you all the praise, the honor, and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Three questions today. They're in your outline. Question number one is this. What is the condition of your heart? Second question is this. What does it mean to be pure in heart? If Jesus says, blessed, happy, are the pure in heart, it's important that we understand what that means. What does it mean to be pure in heart? And question number three is this. What does it mean to see God? Because Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. What does that really mean? Let's flesh out those three questions today. The first question is this. What is the condition of your heart? Now, the first thing that we must do is determine what Jesus means when he refers to to the heart. Obviously, he's not speaking of that organ that we have inside of us that right now is pumping blood through, uh, throughout our body. I trust that, that your heart is working right now. Come on, why don't you take your pulse for just a second, just to make sure that heart is working, okay? All right, it's working, all right? So, but when Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, he's not speaking of that organ that is pumping blood throughout your body. What, what does he mean then when he speaks of the hearts. Well, well, there's a couple of things that I wrote in, in your outline. The first is this. Your heart is the control center of your mind, emotions, and will. When, when Jesus speaks of the heart, he's speaking of the center of our being. He's speaking of the real uh, us. The, the heart is who you really are. It's not necessarily your outward personality, but your inward person. Because quite frankly, the outward persona that you and I demonstrate on a a regular basis isn't necessarily who we are. Because at times we've been conditioned to act, to pretend as if we're one way, but our heart, our person is truly different. You see, the heart is who you are in secret. The heart is the you that no one really knows. I've kind of defined it this way. The heart is the main office. You know, when you're in school, you got to go to the office. What happens at the office? The office is the hub of, of everything that's taking place. It is command central. It's the hub of activity. Well, your heart controls who you are. Your heart controls what you say. Your heart controls what you do. So when Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, he's talking about the real us, the real me, the real you that only he knows. Here are a few verses. Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 7. For as a man thinks in his heart, hearts, so is he. Why, why does Solomon say it that way? Why doesn't Solomon say, for as a man thinks in his mind, or as a man contemplates with his brain? Why is that? Be, because God knows that the real you, the real me, is our hearts. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 4, but Jesus knowing their thoughts. Now wrap your mind around that phrase for just a second. Because right now, Jesus knows exactly what you are thinking, exactly what I'm thinking. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said this, why do you think evil, where? In your hearts. So so the heart is the control center of the mind, the will, and the emotions. The heart is also the fountain from which your words and your actions flow. 
Uh, two verses, Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23. The writer of Proverbs says, Keep your heart with all vigilance. Why? Because from it flows the springs of life. He's not talking about the blood that flows from your heart. He's talking about those thoughts, those actions, those words that spring from where? From your heart, because the real you is the fountain of everything that you say and do and think. Luke 6.45, your text says Matthew. I apologize, it's Luke 6.45. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. And the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil. Notice what Jesus says. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Hey, have you ever heard a, a friend or, or a family member or maybe even you have said something and you're like, wow, where did that come from? Uh, I mean, someone said something that absolutely amazed you. Maybe they used some foul language or, or maybe, you know, this, this anger just blurted out of their mouth. Or maybe you've expressed it and you're like, man, alive, that kind of surprised me. Where did that come from? Well, the answer very simply is this. It came from your heart. It, it, it comes from my heart because the heart is the fountain from which those words and actions flow. And so, and so the things that you say, the things that you think, the things that you do are an indication of the real condition of your heart. The mouth says what your heart feels, thinks, and believes. Here's the third thing. This is so very important, maybe the most important thing that we'll say in today's message, but this, without Jesus... Your heart is desperately wicked. Without Jesus, your heart is desperately wicked. You might sit back and say, whoa, Brian, I'm a good person. <laughs> All right, I know there's bad people in the world, but I'm, but I'm, a, I'm a good person. Quite frankly, without Jesus, Brian, is desperately wicked. Without Jesus, you are desperately wicked. Here's a verse. Write this down, underline it, memorize it. Jeremiah ch chapter 17 and verse 9. The heart is deceitful and above all things desperately sick. Who can understand it? The word sick there is an interesting word. Here's what the word sick means. It means Medically incurable. That, that's what the word means. Malignant. Dying. So, so the heart, the natural human heart is what? Desperately wicked. It's sick. It's incurable. It cannot cure itself. And if you have, if you have little children, you completely understand what I'm talking about. Um, man, our little granddaughter, Bella, Isabella, she's like the most beautiful thing in the world. Does anybody agree with me? You see pictures of my granddaughter. Thank you. All right. If, if you haven't seen, you can go to Brian Burkholder's Facebook page, and we will regularly give you pictures of my beautiful granddaughter. Absolutely gorgeous. Raised in a preacher's home. Man, but Isabella can demonstrate some rebelliousness and some wickedness as a two-year-old. Isabella, don't do that. No! And we're like, my word, where, where did that come from? This little, beautiful, gorgeous girl all of a sudden is demonstrating outright rebellion. And I, I mean, we're like, we're like, Justin, what are you teaching your daughter? I mean, I, I, I mean, good grief, aren't you teaching your daughter? Man, they don't have to teach her to be disrespectful and disobedient and discourteous. Why? It comes from her heart. And even though outwardly Isabella is as beautiful and as gorgeous as any little two-year-old can be, she has a sinful heart. Oh, she has a sinful heart that needs Jesus. And, and our prayer on a regular basis is that little Isabella one of these days would realize how desperately she needs 
Jesus. Here's the truth. You cannot fix a sick heart yourself. You cannot fix a sick heart yourself. You desperately need need Jesus. He is the only one who can heal a sick heart. He is the only one who can cleanse a dirty heart. You must turn to him in faith, accepting and appropriating his perfect life and his vicarious death for you on the cross. That is the only hope that you have. And that is the only hope that I have. You cannot fix yourself. A New Year's resolution will not do it. Going to an AA meeting will not do it. Getting a new job will not do it. Disassociating yourself from certain friends will not do it. It might help, but it will not cure you. You need the great physician. And the great physician is Jesus Christ. That's what, the, that's what Jesus is saying. Psalm 51.10, David says, Create in me, O God, a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Proverbs 3.5, Trust in the Lord, you know the verse. How? With all your hearts. And don't lean to your own understanding. John 14.1, Don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. You see, catch this today, please. I I want to make sure nobody misunderstands what I'm saying today. To purify your hearts is not something that you and I do. I don't want you to walk out of here today saying, okay, wow, okay, Brian, you hit me right here. From now on, I'm going to purify my heart. I'm going to live pure. I'm not going to say those bad things. I'm not going to think those good thoughts. Listen, those are great intentions but you cannot do it yourself. You desperately need Jesus. You desperately need the gospel. And the gospel is not just a get out of hell card. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ that redeems me, that saves me. But it's the gospel of Jesus Christ that that today changes me. And I appropriate the power of the gospel in my life so that I might demonstrate purity. Without Jesus, your heart is desperately wicked. And I would say if you're here today, if you're a religious person, if you're not a religious person, and you do not have a personal faith in Jesus Christ, that's point A. That's where you and I begin. Uh, let me show you another thing. Although, visible to, or, although not visible to everyone around you, your heart is clearly seen by God kind of messed that up a little bit. Let me say it again. Although not visible to everyone around you, your heart is clearly visible to God. Hey, we can look at each other today. We're a pretty good looking bunch, all right? I'm looking out. You're a pretty good looking bunch. You clean up well, all right? All right. We can look at each other externally, but we cannot look at each other internally. That's why, that's why it's so easy to pretend being something that we're not. I, I was listening. Vicky put a CD in my car the other day. I really like that CD. Is that Casting Crowns? What did you put in there? Casting Crowns, uh, um, she takes care of me in so many different ways. Feeds me, puts CDs in my car, all of that kind of stuff. So it was a great song I was listening to. I'm probably m- messing up the words, but it's called The Scandal of the Stained Glass. And the song's talking about the fact that we come to church in stained We don't have stained glass here, but, but, but you come to beautiful church buildings and you pretend to be something you're not. And we have this persona that we demonstrate, the scandal of the stained glass. Very simply, you might fool me. I might fool you. We might be able to pretend that we're something that we're not to all kinds of different people because the internal is not visible to those around us. But let us not be deceived into thinking that God cannot see our heart. Because at this precise moment, God knows exactly the condition 
of your hearts. Several verses, 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. For man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. Man, the nation of Israel, Saul, King Saul looked, man, pristine. I mean, he was a physical specimen. He, he was everything that they wanted in a king. Outwardly, he was perfect. But God not only saw the outside, God saw the inside. And God doesn't look at people like you and I look at people. God doesn't look at you the way I look at you. God looks and sees the inside. He sees the heart. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, notice, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the hearts. The idea is this, God knows your hearts. As I look at you today, man, you look like wonderful people but I do not know the condition of your heart. I can guess, sometimes I guess right, sometimes I guess wrong, but be assured of the fact that God, with his divine x-ray glasses, at this moment knows the precise condition of your heart. So, so the first question we have to ask ourselves is this, what's the condition of my heart today? What's the condition of your heart Second, the second question is this. What does it mean to be pure in heart? Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart. What does that mean? Well, let's jump right into it. The word pure comes from the Greek word. I won't pronounce it correctly, but you have it there, katharos. I always put a Spanish twist on it. From which we get our word catharsis. That you're familiar with the word catharsis. The basic meaning is to be made pure. By, by cleansing from dirt, filth, and contamination. The word, this, uh, the, this Greek word was often used of metals that had been refined until all of the impurities were removed, leaving only pure metal. Now, now and here's what the word means. Obviously, he's not talking about re removing all the physical impurities and all of that, but he's speaking in spiritual terms. Speaking in spiritual terms, it's speaking of undivided devotion to God. Spiritual integrity and true righteousness. Here's what I wrote in your notes. When applied to the heart, it has the idea of being single-minded. It has the idea of being single-minded. There's, no, uh, there's no mixture of impurity with purity. There's no being focused on several different things. When you're pure in heart, you have a single-minded devotion towards God. Christians, through the years, we have struggled with being single-minded. Now, now think with me today. The opposite of single-minded is what? Double-minded. You're familiar with that phrase. The opposite of single-minded is double-minded. So, so flesh that out with me. To be double-minded means that you have a heart divided between the world and God. To be double-minded in our spiritual life means that we're trying to focus on two different things. It's not like we're completely running away from God. God, I'm, I'm looking at you out of the corner of my eye. <laughs> All right, but I'm looking at this, too. All right? We're, we're double-minded. We're trying to see two things at the exact same time. The Bible talks about that. In James chapter 1 and verse 8, talking about an unstable man, James says, but such a person is double-minded, unstable in all of their ways. James chapter 4 and verse 8, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. What does he say? You double-minded. Listen, to be double-minded, it's not like, like I just have blurred vision. It's a problem that I have to deal with. To be double-minded is a sin. Why is that? 
Because it takes our focus. It takes our concentration off of God and puts it on something else. For some reason, spiritually, we justify it. In other areas of our life, we recognize that there's a problem. For example, could, could you look at your wife today and say, honey, I want you to know I'm happily married to you, but I'm in love with two different women at the exact same time. How would that fly in your marriage? Wouldn't fly very well in mine. All right, Vicki, look at me and say, man, you either love me or what? Hit the door, Jack. All right, we're not... I'm not going to allow you to, to, to have a double focus. In marriage, you can't be double-minded. Hey, quite honestly, in politics, you can't be double-minded. You're either, you're either one or the other. You're either a Republican or a Democrat. You might say, hey, I'm an independent. Okay, I guess you can be that. But you can't vote for both parties at the exact same time. you got to be one or the other. When you're watching a ball game, you can't sit back and someone say, so Brian, who are you cheering for? I'm cheering for both teams. I'm, uh, you're what? Yeah, 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 I'm cheering for both teams. Yeah, yeah, wait a second, the Jets are playing the Dolphins. Who do you want to win? I want both teams to win. No, you can't be double-minded. You gotta look at the person and say, no, you either gotta choose one or the other. You can't sit back and say, yay, the Dolphins scored. And I realize we hardly ever say that, so that's, that's difficult. <laughs> yay, the Dolphins scored. And at the same time saying, oh my word, the Dolphins scored. I can't believe that. Go Dolphins, go Jets. You're either one or the other. I believe our Dolphin fans would give a hearty amen. You cannot be a Dolphins fan and a Jets fan at the exact same time. <laughs> Is that right? Is that right? Um, Apologies to Jets fans here today, all right? Why is it then in our life, in our spiritual lives, we feel like we can be double-minded? Here's what Jesus is saying. You cannot be focused on God and on the world at the exact same time. Jesus said it this way in Matthew chapter 6. We'll study these verses in just a few weeks. Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will love the one and you will hate the other. Then he gets really specific. You cannot serve God and money. Now, why did he have to do that? Why in the world did he have to put money in there? We were in agreement with him until all of a sudden he starts putting money in the passage. Why is that? Because for many people, money has become their God. It's all about making. It's all about success. It's all about possessions. Here's what Jesus is saying, whether it's money, whether it's recreation, whether it's sports, whether it's a relationship, you cannot serve two things at the exact time. Same time. All right, those that are parents realize you cannot chase two children at the exact same time. Are you with me? One's running this direction, and all of a sudden the other one's running the other direction. That's why we always joke, you know, with, with one kid, man, we could double team one kid. You get two kids, we still got it covered. Man to man defense, we're good right there. All of a sudden that third kid comes along, and what do you got to do? You got to go to a zone right away. Why? Because you can't chase after three kids with only two people, all right? You can only go one way at a time. Yet, there are many, many believers, Brian included, many times in my life, that were focused on something other than God. We kind of have God in our periphery vision, but we're not completely focused on him. We're what? We are double-minded. So, so to be single-minded then means to be totally and completely focused on Jesus. That, when he says, be pure in heart, that's what he's talking about. To not be distracted. For, for your life to be focused on Jesus. Hey, remember what it was like when you first fell in love? I know some of you have been married for a while. Have you forgotten what it was like when you first fell in love? Remember when you first fell in love, you could not take your eyes off of your significant other. I mean, there might have been all kinds of other people around you, 
and you were fixed on your. I mean, there was. I mean, you were in the restaurant, and all kinds of people were talking, and you wouldn't take your eyes off of your boyfriend, girlfriend, your significant other. Why? Man, you were focused on him. You were focused on her. You, you were so devoted back then. By the way, we should be today, too. I'm not saying we shouldn't be. Right, Vicky? I should be. I don't know how many times Vicky says, are you listening to me? Are you looking at me? Yeah. All right. Rightfully, justfully so. If we're not careful, we do the same thing in our relationship with the Lord. All right, we are, we are focused on other things. Matthew 6, we'll see it in just a few weeks. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. We have a tendency in this day and age to think that as long as God's in the top five, we're in good shape. Uh, all right, God, you're not on top, but hey, what? You know what? You're not at the bottom either, God. <laughs> you're, you're in number two, or, or, or God, you're in number three, and you're moving up, God. Uh, I, I, I mean, let's be honest. Sometimes we justify things in our life as if, okay, God, you're not really there, but you know what? I'm thinking about putting you there as if God's like, oh, my word, I'm honored. I'm so honored that you would think of putting me first in your life. Jesus says, but seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and then all these things will be added to you. We want all these things, and then we want God. And Jesus says, no, it doesn't work that way. Here's another verse. Matthew chapter 22, verse 37. Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. And so, to be pure in heart doesn't mean, man, all of a sudden I'm going to stop doing bad things. To be pure in heart means... I realize I need Jesus. And I cannot take my eyes off of him. Not for a day, not for an hour, not for a minute. I cannot take my eyes off him because the moment I take my eyes off of him, what happens? I fall and I fail. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in hearts. To be pure in heart means to be focused completely on Jesus. So here's what Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. So our third question is this, what does it mean to see God? Well, the great blessing of those whose heart has been purified by the gospel, who because of God's grace and because of his empowerment have a single-minded devotion. The great blessing is Jesus said, blessed are those who are pure in heart, who have received me by grace, have accepted my forgiveness, who realize their dependence upon me. Blessed are those people who are pure in heart, for they shall, will, certainly will see. Here's a more literal translation. Blessed are those who are pure in heart, for they shall continuously be seeing God for themselves. Literal translation. So what does that mean? Does that mean that, okay, I'm going to have dreams of God every single night? Or does that mean I'm going to have visions of him and I'm going to see him? No, obviously, that's not what, our mean, what it means. The idea is this. When our hearts are purified at salvation and we begin to live in the presence of God, we recognize his presence. By the way, do you realize that God's with you all the time? Sometimes we feel like we have to ask him to come or ask him to stay. He has already promised that he is with you. And yet we wake up and we live our lives failing to recognize his presence in our life. And so when I, when I receive his forgiveness and I daily recognize his presence in my life, we begin to see and to comprehend Jesus with new spiritual eyes. Let me just give you three practical things and I'm done and we'll partake of the Lord's Supper today. What does it mean to see Jesus? It means to be admitted into his presence. 
means to be admitted into his presence. As believers, we will literally be ushered into his presence. The tense of the verb is found in the future perfect. It's something that we can can grab a hold of and take to the bank. It's not a one-time thing, but it's something that we're going to experience for all of eternity. And even now, we have the privilege of of talking to him, of, of, of relating with him. And one day, as John says, we will see him. We will talk to him. We will touch him. His presence will become a visible reality in our lives. John says it this way, beloved, beloved, we are God's children now. But we know that when he appears... We will be like him. Catch this. We will see him. We'll see him as he is. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 4. I love this verse. John says, they will see his face. And their name will be on his foreheads. Last week I asked you to pray for Pastor Jose's mom, Gladys. Santiago, what a great and godly lady she was. Prayed for her all through the weekend. Prayed for her on Monday. Her condition continued to deteriorate. On Tuesday night, I was here for a missions team meeting. As I'm walking out the door, I get a simple text from Jose that simply said this, Brian, mom's with Jesus. Hey, I went to the hospital, gathered with the family, some of the families here, and kind of gathered around Gladys's body, but we were reminded of the fact that Gladys was no longer there. At that precise moment, where was Gladys? She was in the presence of Jesus Christ. And we were joking at that moment, Gladys was with Mike. Mike, uh, Mike was with her at that moment, and Ruthie and, and Sharon, some of the folks that we've lost in, in, in recent days. We say we've lost them. Heaven's gained them, and we're going to see them someday. But just think of the reality. Mike has seen Jesus. Gladys has seen Jesus. Ruthie has seen Jesus. Sharon has seen Jesus. Jonathan has seen Jesus. Blessed are the pure in heart. They will see God. What a a great promise for us. Let me give you a, a second thing. The second thing is this. It means to be awestruck by his glory. To to see God means to be awestruck by his glory. Uh, Let me read. Kind of think with me for just a second if you can. Think Think with me as I read this. This is a quote from John Piper. Virtually all of our spiritual sight in this life is mediated to us through the word of God or the work of God in providence. We see images and reflections of God's glory. We hear echoes and reverberations of his voice, but we don't truly see him. But there will come a day when God himself will dwell among us. His glory will no longer be inferred from lightning and mountains and roary seas and constellation of stars. Instead, our experience of him will be direct. His glory will be the very light in which we move and live and have our being. And the beauty of his holiness will be tasted directly, just like honey on the tongue. And I promise you, when you see Jesus, you will be awestruck by his glory. I'm reminded of John, who was Jesus' buddy. I don't mean to be blasphemous when I say that. He leaned on Jesus' breast. He said they were close. And yet in Revelation, the beginning of Revelation, when John sees Jesus in all of his glory, how does John respond to his friend? He falls on his face as if he were dead. It means to be awestruck by his glory. There's just one third thing. It means to be comforted by his grace. Comforted by his grace. Repeatedly the psalmist cried out to God asking him to not hide his face from them. Here's a verse, Psalm 27, 7 through 9. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me. I have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. 
think with me, it's during the difficult times of our life that God allows us to catch a glimpse of his presence. It's during those difficult times that the real condition of our hearts is tested. I told you that I do a yearly stress test. Do it almost every year. Just did it a couple months ago. Thumbs up. Heart's working good. So, so, but the same thing happens to me every year when I take a stress test. By the way, I hate taking a stress test, all right, but you got to do it. And so, and so they put me, a, you know, they put the dye into you and, the, you know, they do the whole imaging thing. And then, the, then they put you on the treadmill, you know, hook you up to everything and they put you on the treadmill. And it happens all the time. I start walking on that treadmill and I'm thinking, this is a piece of cake, this, uh, I'm going to pass this test with flying colors. I'm walking. I'm watching my heart. It's going absolutely great. I'm thinking, man, look how good and strong my heart is. And after about two minutes, the nurse says, okay, we're going to speed it up for just a little bit. And then all of a sudden, they speed it up for just a little bit. And I'm still like, look at that. I'm doing really good. I'm doing really good. I could go forever on this thing. And so then after about two minutes, she says, I'm going to speed it up one more time. Oh, my word. And all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, oh, how much longer? You know, my heart rate's generally about 70 beats per minute. They like to get up to about 170. It feels like they want to get up to like 300 or something like that. And so by that moment, my heart is literally coming out of my chest. I'm gasping. I feel like I'm having a heart attack on the, on the treadmill. All right, thankfully I'm not. They're watching my heart and everything is okay. Now let me ask you something. Why do they do that? Why do they do that? Because the heart is best tested how? Under stress. I mean, you know, we want to live a stress-free life. God, have you ever prayed this? Please take away all my problems from me. I don't want to have any problems. And if you listen to some preachers, they're going to tell you, trust Jesus, no more problems. That's not in the Bible. It's not. God willingly, purposefully, at times, puts our heart under stress. Why? Because it enables us to see the condition of your heart. So whenever God brings a problem in your life, how do you respond? Do you run to him or do you run away from him? When God brings a problem in your life, do you praise him or do you complain to him? When God brings a problem in your life, do you trust him or do you distrust him? It's really important for us to do a spiritual checkup. What's the condition of your heart? today. The good thing is we have a loving, forgiving, patient, long-suffering heavenly Father who not only puts up with us, but is willing to forgive us at any moment, no matter how many times we've failed him. And he's willing to give us the strength and the empowerment that we need to be what? To be pure in hearts.